Okay, let's get started. I'm going to be talking today about um, a topic that I've gotten just recently very interested in, and that is um, the other stories aside from the Lord of the Rings um, in the Silmarillion that Tolkien spent his life on. And so today I'm going to be talking about um, a favorite of mine, and I'm calling it Waiting for Arendelle, because it's about that character. I'll start with one of the most quoted portions of the much quoted letter that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote in 1951 to Milton Waldman of Collins Publishing. And forgive me if I'm going over old ground. Once upon a time, Tolkien wrote, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, which I could dedicate simply to my country, to England. I would draw some of the great tales in fullness and leave many only placed in the scheme and sketched. The cycle should be linked to a majestic whole. That was Tolkien's description of his so-called mythology for England. And the letter written some 35 years after Once Upon a Time was a pitch to persuade Waldman that the Lord of the Rings and the body of more or less connected legend should be published together. The project fell through and the world had to wait till 1977 and Christopher Tolkien's publication of the Silmarillion to learn more about those great tales, both the ones drawn in fullness and the ones only placed in the scheme and sketched. The ones drawn in fullness were the fall of Gondolin, Baron and Luthien, and the children of Hurin, first written in the years 1916 to 1919, then published piecemeal in the history of Middle Earth, and now available thanks to Christopher in single volumes. But today I want to talk about one that was only placed in the scheme and sketched. A tale surrounded, I find, with confusion, and a tale not so much written as written about in the other great tales. That is the tale of Arundel. All the great tales go back to the earliest period of Tolkien's myth-making, but the tale of Arundel goes farthest back of all. It began in 1913 at Exeter College, where Tolkien first read Christ, a poem in Old English by the ninth century Mercian poet Kinewolf. Two lines jumped out at him. Ela Erendel, Engla Bertast, over midden yerd, monum sender. Hail Erendel, brightest of angels above, Middle Earth sent to men. When I came across that citation, Tolkien wrote many years later, I felt a curious thrill as if something had stirred in me half wakened from sleep. There was something very remote and strange and beautiful behind those words, if I could grasp it, far beyond ancient English. Although he gave this speech to a character in his short story, The Notion Club Papers, the vividness of the feelings described makes it clear that he was describing his own experience. The key words are, if I could grasp it, because as we will see, he didn't grasp it, at least not right away. He tried first by writing his own Arundel lines, The Voyage of Arundel, The Evening Star in 1914. Arundel sprang up from the ocean's cup in the gloom of the midworld's rim from the door of night as a ray of light leaped over the twilight brim and launching his bark like a silver spark from the golden fading sand down the sunlit breath of day's fiery death, 
he sped from Westerland. Both Humphrey Carpenter and John Garth, two well-known Tolkien biographers, have tagged this poem as the beginning of Tolkien's mythology, the seed from which the whole legendarium sprang. That's easy to see in retrospect, especially now that we have the Silmarillion and can connect all the pieces, but it wasn't all that obvious at the time, even to its author. Carpenter tells us that Tolkien showed the, and I quote, original Arundel lines to his friend G.B. Smith, who asked him, again a quote, what they were really about. Tolkien's reply was that he didn't know, but he would try to find out. From this, Carpenter concluded that Tolkien saw himself as a discoverer of legend rather than as an inventor. But here's where the trouble begins, because it's unclear whether Carpenter meant the original Arundel lines of the Kinnewolf poem or those of Tolkien's original Arundel poem. This creates enough ambiguity to complicate both Smith's question and Tolkien's answer. If we don't know which lines Smith was asking about, then we cannot be sure what it was that told, <coughs> sorry, that Tolkien wanted to find out. He already knew from his studies that Arundel's Old Norse name was Aurvendil and his Danish name was Horvendil, that various versions of his story went back to Proto-Germanic myths so old it was untraceable, that he had a ship called Vingalot in which he voyaged through the skies. These seem like answers, but they were clearly not the ones Tolkien wanted to find. So Smith's question remains on the table. What are the lines really about? And which lines are they? The most I can say is that both seem to be about the same thing, whatever that is. Other than that, I cannot answer either question and the two men who could have have both been dead for many years. So the only authority left is Tolkien's letters. And that's where I'll turn now. In the draft of a letter written many years to a Mr. Rang, who was inquiring about nomenclature, that is names and naming, Tolkien wrote of Arundel that it was the most important name and that to his mind, its Anglo-Saxon uses seemed plainly to indicate that it was a star presaging the dawn. That is, and this is Tolkien writing, what we now call Venus, the morning star, as it may be seen shining brilliantly in the dawn before the actual rising of the sun. He added in a note to this passage that the lines refer to a herald, a divine messenger. Now, I think we ought to keep in mind that Tolkien was writing in 1967 with 2020 hindsight about a word he saw in 1913. However clear it might have been by 1967, in 1913, Tolkien's poem appears as oblique as Kinnewolf's little couplet. Tolkien's Arundel springs up but speeds down. Where is he going? Why? And how does he get there? Tolkien, as I read it, had still to find out. Thus, out of a name and a question, a mythology was born. What Tolkien's poem was trying to say without saying it was that as the evening star follows the setting sun in the west, to reappear as the morning star ahead of the sun in the east. So Arundel's voyage carries him below the Western horizon and under the earth to follow the same trajectory. 
one of the earliest known of Tolkien's maps titled Ivene Kemen, or the shape of the earth, the vessel of the earth, is reproduced in the Book of Lost Tales. According to Christopher, it is closely associated with the cosmology and is Tolkien's drawing of the earth as a ship representing a more or less flat vessel floating on water. So the much later bending of the earth in Tolkien's Numenorean cataclysm assumes an original flat earth, in which case the quickest way for Arundel to get from west to east would be to double under like the bottom of an escalator loop and reverse his direction to come out again at the top. In later versions of his own poem, Tolkien had tried to clarify this by writing how Arundel arose where the shadow flows while threading his path or the aftermath of the splendor of the sun. This is a little better, but not much. It's still a confusing image, difficult to convey poetically and without laborious explanations of orbits and retrograde movement. And furthermore, celestial mechanics aside, what is the point? There's no clear reason in the poem itself for this perpetual repetitive escalator-like journey. Nothing in the name or the literature behind it gave Tolkien an answer to Smith's question, though he tried to find a partial answer in another poem he wrote in 1915, The Shores of Fairy. Here, Arundel goes west of the moon, east of the sun, beyond Taniquatil in Valinor, where are the shores of fairy, the haven of the star. Well, at least we don't got a star. So this is a little help, but again, it's not much. We do have place names to tie the action. Though the reason for the journey is still obscure, Smith's question still stands and raises the provocative question whether Tolkien's entire legendarium, all those tales, might have grown out of his simple need to find out about Arundel and where he was going and why, which of course, in a sense, he did. As everybody now knows, Tolkien's Arundel, through all his various spellings, and I'm not gonna go into those, umlauts and ayal and el, was the half-elven offspring of a human man, Tuor of the house of Beor, and an elven princess, Idril, daughter of Turgon, Lord of Gondolin. Tolkien put Arundel in Gondolin so that he could escape when the city fell, making his survival of thematic importance to the story as it developed. Afterward, as an adult, Arundel was to meet Elwing, granddaughter of Baron and Luthien. I hope you're keeping up with all of this, uh, and also half Elven. He would receive from her the one remaining Silmaril for which the whole legendarium is named, the other two being buried in earth and sea, and become its bearer in an endless star journey across the skies as a sign of hope to men. So he now at least has a believable identity as a messenger. But none of the foregoing was common knowledge in the days when only the Lord of the Rings had been published. At that time, Arendelle was primarily identified as the name linked to the star whose light Galadriel caught in her mirror. It was associated with the Silmaril that Baron took from Morgoth's iron crown, but only tangentially as a story Sam Gamgee suddenly realizes that he is in, or as part of Aragorn's retelling on Weathertop of the tale of Tenuvial, where Aragorn alludes to Arundel 
that sailed his ship out of the mists of the world with the Silmaril upon his brow. Bilbo's poem at Rivendell about Arendelle and Elwing tells the whole story, but Frodo's comment that it seemed to me to fit somehow raises the question, fit what? If Frodo knows of a larger framework, he doesn't say, and neither does Tolkien. This may be the earliest published example of a Tolkien technique that I'm gonna talk about some more, a bait and switch in which he plants an item and then changes the subject. This creating a deliberate loose end in an otherwise tight narrative. The few Arendelle entries in the index to volume three of Lord of the Rings are not much help either. They inform, but they do not explain. The last chapter of the Quinta Silmarillion tells in four pages of the voyage of Arendil, but it's kind of a synopsis, a brief account of his marriage with Elwing and their voyaging with the Silmaril. One sentence refers to a lay of Arendil, wherein is many a thing sung of his adventures in the deep and in lands untrodden and in many seas and many isles. But after this skeleton account, Arundel starts popping up everywhere, making cameo appearances in unfinished tales, in the Book of Lost Tales, the shaping of Middle-earth, lays of Beleriand and the Lost Road, and in Christopher's standalone editions of The Fall of Gondolin and Baron and Luthien. But he's a walk-on. <laughs> He's an extra in many other characters' productions, but he never gets to star in his own. That there ought to be a tale of Arundel to go with the other three now seems obvious, although Christopher has commented more than once that it was never written. It is sometimes referred to as the fourth great tale. And here is where confusion is worse confounded. Because I would think what we have starting here is what I'm gonna call false advertising. Tolkien pulls his bait and switch. In his prologue to the fall of Gondolin, Christopher cites a tale of Arundel in which the original title of Tuor and the Exiles of Gondolin is followed by the announcement, and I'm quoting, which bringeth in the great tale of Arundel. But he goes no farther, perhaps because he, being Christopher, had already dealt with the same situation at greater length in the Book of Lost Tales. This is volume two, the one with the red cover. It's in that book that we get the clearest picture of Tolkien's whole frame for his mythology, the presence on the island of Tall Erisea of Ariel the Mariner, and the whole setup of people telling him the stories that he will bring back to England and make its mythology. So stick with me here. On this occasion, a request for the tale of the Nagla frame. Remember, everybody's telling tales back and forth. The Nalglafring, that is the dwarf's necklace containing the Silmaril, is met with the protest that the tale of Arundel should properly come first and is requested as soon as may be. So after some toing and froing among the links, the tale of the Nalglafring is told and at its end, the narrator Ilos wraps it up by saying, quote, Thus did all the fates of the fairies weave then to one strand, and that strand is the great tale of Arundel, and to that tale's true beginning we are now come. But we aren't, because here's where Tolkien pulls his bait and switch. He has Ilos interrupt himself to say, and methinks that is tale enough for this time of telling. 
Not only does the teller, by which I mean Ilos, decide not to tell the tale, the author, by which I mean Tolkien, has hit the pause button to keep it from being told. This forces the editor, and now I'm talking about Christopher, to conclude regretfully that the great tale was never written and we are wholly dependent on highly condensed and contradictory outlines. One of these outlines is what Christopher calls scheme B, which refers to, quote, a mighty tale and seven times shall folk fare to the tale fire ere it be rightly told. In a reversal of the previous order, first Arundel, then the Nauglafring, this was to start with the tale of the Nauglafring and have Arundel make his longed for entrance in the second part of the outline and continue in numbered sec segments, one for each of those seven visits to the tail fire that I take to mean seven separate evenings. Christopher comments that if the parts were each to be of comparable length, the whole tale of Arundel would have been somewhere near half the length of all the tales that were in fact written. But he includes, concludes again, and with obvious regret, that his father never afterward returned to the tale on any ample scale. Now, that's something so often referred to, such a coming attraction, whose appearance was so often heralded with what amounts to a literary fanfare, was never written, raises the question, why? Or rather, why not? Well, the first and most obvious answer is because it's Tolkien, who is famous or infamous for unfinished work. C.S. Lewis called him a great but dilatory and unmethodical man, and his way with deadlines attained near legendary status over the course of his career. John Bowers recently published Tolkien's last Lost Chaucer is an example. This is a selection of Chaucer's works, the Clarendon Chaucer, which was begun, begun in 1922, edited by Tolkien and George Gordon, supervised by Kenneth Sison, but so long delayed by Tolkien's vacillation in completing his part that its publication by Oxford University Press was finally abandoned. Tolkien's part of it was only brought into print by another scholar, John Bowers, nearly a hundred years later. That's a long time to wait for a deadline. An equally telling example is Kenneth Sison's 14th century verse and prose for which Tolkien was supposed to provide the glossary. He began in late 1919 but hadn't got anywhere near finished by 1921 when the volume without the glossary was finally published. The glossary without the volume was published in 1922 as a Middle English vocabulary with the subtitle designed for use with Sizem's 14th century verse and prose. They were finally published together, I think, by 1925. There are instances like these where Tolkien went past an expected deadline and a work didn't appear or appeared later and was a little different from what was planned. But those were occasions when Tolkien was working to someone else's schedule. Were there times when he did the same thing with his own fiction? The answer, as everybody knows, is yes. I still hope to finish a long poem on the fall of Arthur, he wrote in 1965, about a work that had been progress in progress since at least 1934 
and was still unfinished when he died in 1973. The contents of unfinished tales speak for themselves, as does the title of Tuor and his coming to Gondolin, the Narn Ichin Horin, Aldarian and Erendis, the quest of Erebor, the history of Galadriel and Celeborn. All these, and for all we know, others we don't know about, were unfinished during Tolkien's life and left unfinished at his death, like Nigel with his tree. So there is plenty of precedent in the real world. But we're not looking at the real world. We're looking at an imaginary world in which the imaginary telling of the tale of Arundel is delayed for the reader in the real world for reasons that are not explained. Like Gogo and Didi, the two tramps and Samuel Beckett's waiting for Gatto, we are set up to expect the arrival of Arundel, which is always about to happen, but never does. If by chance we're in danger of forgetting about it or losing sight of it among Tolkien's other stories, Tolkien takes pains to remind us that not only does his tale exist, we are about to hear it in imagined time by getting to read it in real time. And then we don't again. So what is the function of this strategy? And is it a strategy or is it just an oversight? Strictly speaking, the great tale of Arundel is not an unfinished tale in the same sense of the others I've mentioned. It might be closer to truth to say it's unbegun, in which case it's legitimate, I think, to ask why the false advertising? Why the bait and switch? What might be the purpose within the fiction? of making the reader in the real world wait for an Arundel who never comes in either world, not just for the duration of one evening in a play, but over and over again in story after story where he doesn't ever come next. Now there is precedent in actual scholarship for this kind of tease. One of the most famous is what's called the great lacuna in the poetic Edda. That's four leaves ripped out of the middle of a manuscript, the Codex Regis, whose absence creates a hole in the story of Sigurd the Volsung that has to be filled in from other sources like the presumably similar section of the Volsunga saga. Tolkien himself had a stab at filling in the gap, as Tom Shippey puts it, in his new lay of the Volsungs, published by Christopher as part of the legend of Sigurd and Gudrun. Another is the doubling of families, not a lack, but an excess, in a story that Tolkien knew a lot about, the story of Kullervo in the Finnish Kalevala, where the compiler, Elias Lonrat, carelessly combined two versions of the same story but just jammed them together without bothering to trim the edges. And there is the so-called lost tale of Wada, described by Tolkien's friend R.W. Chambers as one of the fragments of old Teutonic epic that haunts Germanic studies. The tale of Wada per se does not exist. It is inferred by Germanic scholars from Wada's appearance in other people's stories, rather like Arundel. In Tolkien and the Great War, John Garth commented that Wada, like Arundel, crops up all over Germanic legend. And Garth makes an interesting suggestion. He suggests that there's a possible association between 
the tale of Wada, the lost tale of Wada, and Tolkien's early title for his body of more or less connected legend, the Book of Lost Tales. The phrase lost tale is the obvious point of connection, not just in the words, but in the idea behind them. But the word lost is not the only clue. The name Wada itself is another and leads to Christopher's discussion. Are you with me? <laughs> I hope I'm not going too fast because this zigzag all over the place, but it will settle down. The name Wada is a clue that leads to Christopher's discussion in Lays of Beleriand about poems early abandoned, where in a section devoted to what he calls the fragment, just like Wada, of an alliterative lay of Arundel, he singles out one line for attention, quote, but Wada of the Helsings, weary hearted. Now this is Tolkien in an early fragment of an Arundel poem writing about Wada, who is an actual, if theoretical, character in a, so far as anyone can tell, non-existent poem in Germanic studies. Are you following this? I hope so. Christopher singles out one line for particular attention. Quote, but Wada the Helsings was weary hearted, but Tour, that is Tour, Arundel's father, the earthborn was tried in battle. Now Christopher remarks that the association between Wada and Tour was, quote, not casual backward way of saying it was deliberate, which implies intentional connections or at least correlations among Wada, Tuor, and Tuor's son, Arundel. Christopher further cites Chambers' note on Wada that, quote, he had no story of his own and calls attention to the similarity between Wada's boat Wingalot and Arundel's boat, Wingalot. Coincidence, he says, is ruled out. When coincidence is ruled out, what remains is design. And the design seems intended to connect Arundel with the Wada of Germanic legend, whose tale was lost and who had no story of his own, though he appears in other stories. So this very suggestive set of locutions, not casual, coincidence ruled out is suggestive. He seems to be, at least to me, answering a question that nobody has asked. So I will ask it now. What if Tolkien is doing this on purpose? What if he knowingly, in fact, deliberately conceived of a lost tale of Arundel, whose mention he seeded through his invented legendarium in a reenactment of the lost tale of Wada in the real Germanic one? Whether he did it on purpose or by accident, the effect is the same. The tale that was never written, the great tale of Arundel haunts the legendarium as the ghost of itself, forever sailing across various texts, but never grounded in its own. And if the answer to my question, did he do it on purpose, turns out to be yes, what might that tell us? about Tolkien. Well, it could tell us that he had a sense of humor, 
but we know that. It could tell us that he had a feel for mythological authenticity, but we know that too. So what don't we know? We don't know why. Possible motives are various. It might be an inside joke like the linguistic and philosophical jokes he seeded throughout The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Do you mean it's a good morning or it's a morning to be good on or that you were good on this morning, says Gandalf to Bilbo, who doesn't know how to answer. It might be a practical joke played on scholars to keep them busy, a forgery that never was. Or it might be that his prodigious learning and his fertile imagination combined with his own ambition, which I think we can agree was pretty high flown, could have led him to invent not a missing piece, but the gap where the piece ought to have been. Like the great lacuna or the lost tale of Wada, like the frustrating gaps and missing pieces that real world mythologies not only have, but are famous for. As in the real world, Tolkien's mythology for England would then come complete with the presence of an absence. Much like the lost English mythology whose absence he noted with such regret in his Beowulf essay while he was busily writing his own, also with regret. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. And I hope that I'll get some questions about this uh, because I need, I need some pushback. Well, thank you very much, Verlin. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. And I can assure you, we have a dozen questions already in. So I'm going to start um, picking some of these off. So I'm going to, I'm going to start um, a bit on, we've got a few questions all on the same theme of inability to finish, essentially. Um, so the first, the first one I've got here is what, what do what do we know about Tolkien's apparent inability to finish his work? Was it mainly obsessive niggling, or was it mainly a lack of desire to finish the work and set it in stone, or was he mainly sidetracked so often that finishing was impossible, or might there be um, other underlying reasons? Those are excellent questions, and my answer is yes. <laughs> okay, uh, fair, fair enough. Um, on, on a similar right leaf by niggle. Well, I was going to say on, on leaf, yeah, on leaf by niggle. We've got a question here, which is someone has asked: Would you say that the name Arendil is the is the leaf for Tolkien's great tree? I love it. Yes, I would. Thank you. Can I use that? I, I, I think it's I think it's now in the public domain of uh, Berlin that it was um, Marilyn that provided that question. Okay. Um, and similarly, got a question here from Samuel, which is, do you think it is still necessary for Tolkien to finish his Arendelle story by the time it was abandoned? He had already found out who Arendelle was in that he became a legendary key figure to the Silmarillion's conclusion and the Lord of the Rings background. Okay, um, I think I'd say, yes, it was necessary. Remember that letter to Waldman, a body of more or less connected legend. Um, an ambition like writing a mythology <laughs> for England because you think England doesn't have one, calls for a lot of confidence it seems to me. 
And I think that Tolkien spent a lot of his life, how can I put this? Um, well, very easily spent a lot of his life writing that mythology. It wasn't that he knew a lot about mythology and so he took his knowledge and created his own. It was that he wanted to create his own, so he read a lot of other mythologies so he could practice. He wrote The Fall of Arthur in alliterative meter so he could practice doing alliterative Old English meter in modern English. Uh, he wrote uh, The Lays of Beleriand in various tried and true mythological forms, I think he was practicing. I think he was teaching himself how it was done so that he could do it. And I think that was a lifelong process. And that's one of the many reasons why he never finished. And the others are all his other obligations, for children, not a very munificent salary, um, university committee meetings, which let me tell you, take up a lot of time and get nowhere. Uh, so there were lots of reasons for it, uh, but what he wanted was a mythological reason. He had a model already, the tale of Wada. Um, he had the great lacuna. Things, things just go missing and scholars have to figure out what went wrong. And he, he built that into, um, into his own mythology. There's a great story about Michelangelo when he was a young sculptor, just beginning, just learning that he sculpted a little antique faun and one of his teachers said, it looks a little too healthy. An antique would be a little more worn than your product. So Tolkien took his chisel and knocked out a tooth to make his warm, his, his fawn a little more antique. In a sense, I think that's what Tolkien was doing. He wasn't knocking out a tooth, but he was leaving out a tooth and then telling you that the tooth had been there as a kind of teaser. It's interesting what you say, because I've got a question here that's just coming from uh, Andy Higgins. Uh, he says, thank you so much. Good, good to see you. He also wonders if Tolkien's constant work on the Legendarium, with his going back and back to the stories, deliberately created a mythic body, bo mythic body through which its very process created layers, contradictions, gaps. Etc. And it, of course, it takes a lifetime to yeah, do that. Christopher says says that uh, very plainly. I think in, I believe it's in his forward to the Silmarillion all that long ago. He says my father came to think of it as a sort of inchoate body, like real mythologies, where there are gaps and overlaps and inconsistencies. Uh, and in that respect. And I think I'm quoting Christopher now, but I'm not sure, so don't quote me. Um, in that respect, he was, he Tolkien was pleased with the way that his mythology was taking that same kind of shape. Okay, and there was also a question here from Yelena. She says, could there perhaps be a strong Christian motive behind Tolkien's act of not wanting to reveal the end? Tolkien expanded greatly on the idea of Genesis, but seemed to keep his eschatology secret. Ooh, that's a, that's a very good question, a very fruitful question. How much time have we got, Sean? You, 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 you have got 11 minutes, so. Okay. Uh, well, Elena, as you know, Elena, is that right? I think it's Yelena. Yelena. Um, as you know, Tolkien perpetually sort of looked forward to the second music 
to what he called the kind of Ragnarok finish. Um, he even predicted that Morgoth, this is the second prophecy of Mandos, uh, that Morgoth would be defeated by Turin to Rambar. Uh, so he had that sort of projection out there, but you're quite right. He never gets around to it. And it may very well be that there's a certain inherent respectfulness uh, in, his, in his hesitation um, that he can keep, well, kind of like the tale of, tale of Arundel, the vision of the second music uh, without being arrogant enough to actually go ahead and write the end of the world. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it's interesting, a, a further question just come in is, discovery in medieval philosophy is about finding what is already there. So more of an uncovering of what exists but has been lost. Similarly, in classical thought and, and Tolkien studied classics before switching to English, the Socratic method is about drawing out of the questioner the answer they already know but are not aware of or have lost. Any similarity of these to Tolkien's approach to his mythology? For uh, well, uh, they're two faces of the same thing. The Socratic method is designed to bring to um, the questionee uh, knowledge that is already known but not realized. Uh, and Tolkien is sort of turning the mirror the other way. Would that, does that make any sense? I think so. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions now about, about Aaron Dill himself, because we've got a few of these, and this was another of the themes that came out. So Will asks, um, so thank you very much for the talk. You noted that Aaron Dill is half man, half elf. And for this reason, is, it is quite striking that he's allowed to reach Valinor, given his split lineage. Why was a figure who can, who can be understood as other be able to reach Valinor when so many others had failed? I don't know. I think you would have to ask Tolkien about that. He is half Elven, and maybe that's enough. The fact that the Arendelle we do know about sprang almost fully armed from G.B. Smith's question doesn't mean that all of the possible inconsistencies in his character are solved. And that may very well be one. Um, there's bound to be a conference coming up somewhere where you could present this question as a paper. Sean, I know there got, there's got to be other conferences coming up this summer. So whoever asked that question, go for it. There you go, Will. Re recommendation from Verlin there for your next paper. Um, right, I have a question from um, Denise here. It, she says, it's interesting that those starting with the idea of Arendelle as a star or, or Venus, Tolkien's storytelling led him to create the character as an elf that is not one of the Valar. She says, I can't remember now, are there any hints anywhere of what led him to start developing the idea in that direction rather than exploring Arendelle as a Valar or Maya? Because he's really writing about human beings. I mean, he talks an awful lot about elves, I grant you that. But what he, what he wanted or came to want to explore was the problem of death. And it's human beings who die. So maybe it's that there was just enough of that in Arundel to make him the exception that tests the rule. Other than that, I honestly can't with authority go any farther. 
I'd love to get into Tolkien's head. So would we all, but I can't. All I know is what's on the page. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we all would. Uh, but there is there is another question from Constantine, which I think is is related. And he said, Tolkien tried to make his writings more astronomically correct in his late transformed myths. Yes, what is did. your opinion? How could he deal with Arendil while the Earth obviously became a planet going its way around the sun and Venus could not be the Silmaril on the Mariner's head? Elves in Rivendell listened to, the, to Bilbo's poem as the true story and Arendil's light did help in reality in the reality of the Lord of the Rings. So the explanation of human myths seems to be incorrect. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so he says Tolkien tried to, to make it to make his writings more astronomically correct in his late oh, transform. I think I get it. Yeah. He tried to bring it into conformity with real astronomy. So my explanation that it was human mortality doesn't fit. Have I got you? Do I read you right? You can tell Sean. We'll, we'll, ha we'll have to see if Constantine comes up with a further comment. Okay, well, I'm, I'll try to answer. I think that was a huge mistake. Uh, and I think Christopher was very, very worried about it too. All those post Lord of the Rings corrections, took it down from myth to scientific theory and, and ruined the, the poetry. I don't mean the verse, I mean the poetry, the making of the whole wonderful story. He should have left well enough alone. Cool. Uh, Constantine's written thank you. So I think that I think that clearly did um, address his question. I hope so. Um, it's a good question. He's written there. I said I understand the answer, and the answer is for the questions. So there we go. Oh. Um. So, just a couple more before we wrap up. Um. How important to Tolkien's final plot of the Silmarillion would you say Arendil is? He has some key roles and is alluded to from near the beginning as the greatest Marino of song, but is not featured directly or with much agency in many chapters. I don't think he adds materially to the, to the sinews of the story. You, you really want to know my opinion. I find Arendelle to be a fairly dull character compared to Baron compared to Turin to Rambar, compared to Frodo, compared to Aragorn. Uh, he sails across the sky over and over and over again. But as a, as a character, it, he's got nothing worth exploring. Well, that's... That's a slight overlay. We can, we can use that as a quote in future. Verlin Flieger says, I find Aaron do a bit of a dull character. Uh, um, <laughs> so just, uh, just moving on to the um, uh, next question. So we've got two more minutes. Um, uh, do you think that Tolkien was trying to intentionally create the same effect with the, ab with the absence of the Tower of Endel than the one modern readers of Beowulf and the Fight of Finsburg experience when reading those works, or in a wider context, yes. the Lacunae readers. Yes, okay. fair enough. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. I think he might very well, this is speculation now, I think he might have enjoyed it. He might have, he might have had his tongue firmly in his cheek and thought, ah, I know how to get him. This will be a good one. He did have a sense of humor. So the answer to your question is yes. The answer to the question is yes. Cool. Yes. Um, 
we have the short summary of the tale in the published Quentus Silmarillion, as you mentioned. Yeah. How do you think the existence of this piece fits into the picture? Of what piece? Oh, the piece in the Silmarillion? Yes. Well, I think that may be what Frodo was trying to say when he said it seems to fit somehow, although he had not read the Silmarillion when he said that. Uh, I, I think that that's, Tolkien wrote synopses. Uh, there's something called the sketch of the mythology, uh, which is essentially kind of like a long book report that he wrote for his old teacher at uh, King Edward's. Um, Richard, what was his name, Dickey? Oh gosh, I can't remember his last name. Reynolds, Dickey Reynolds. Um, and Christopher uses that a lot in his editions in the history of Middle Earth and especially in um, the three great tales that he published. Um, the Fall of Gondolin, Baron and Luthien <clears throat> and the Children of Horan. He fills in gaps with quotes from the sketch of the mythology. Uh, he doesn't do that in the Children of Huron. There he just, I think brilliantly, and I can't quite figure out how, puts everything together, but makes it one complete and seamless narrative. In his volumes on Baron and Luthien and the Fall of Gondolin, he goes from one source to another to another. One in the Fall of Gondolin is four lines long. But Christopher puts it in because it's a bridge from one piece to another. It's kind of like driving over bumps in the road. If you read it, it's not a, it's not a novel. It's a, it's an analysis. It shows not the story, but the story of the story, how it, how it progressed or didn't. I hope that helps. I think it does. I'm going to take one final question here. This is from another Sean, um, Sean from the Prancing Pony podcast. Um, Wada is the father of Wayland the Smith in Germanic myth. Arendelle's story is hinted at by Smith of Wooten Major. Could these references to great Smiths be nods to G.B. Smith? And if so, what might that tell us? Can you, I need to get the premise of that question. Could you repeat it, Sean, slowly? <laughs> no, sorry, uh, Wade is the father of Wayland the Smith in Germanic myth. Wade is the father of Wayland. Okay, I got that much. Yeah, Arendelle's story is hinted at by Smith of Wooten Major. Could these references to great Smiths be nods to G.B. Smith? And if so, what might that tell us? Yes. I think they certainly were. Um, I think G.B. Smith and the death of G.B. Smith were terribly important influences in all of Tolkien's life and absolutely in what he wrote. I think that your question is right on the money. Excellent. And I think I think with that, we've um, taken up enough of your time this afternoon, Verlin. So I want to thank you very much um, for speaking to us today. And I'm sure everybody will join me in saying thank you um, for joining us and for a very, very interesting talk. Thank you, Sean. Thank you all for your questions. They were great. I wish we had another hour. <laughs>